Hello everyone! I've taken a brief hiatus from Quantum Leap reviews and working on the sequel to my first novel, Holocene, in order to participate in the Game Dev TV Game Jam for 2023. This year's theme was Life in Two Dimensions, and my entry is Quiddle, a very rough prototype of a game where you play as the titular Quiddle, a jelly-like creature that can consume water to inflate in size, freeze into solid ice cubes, or evaporate into a gaseous state and float around. I plan to do a longer video talking about my experiences during the jam and the softbody physics I created within Unity for the game. But in the meantime, reviews have thus far been very positive, with people urging me to continue developing it. I didn't have much time during the jam to build what I wanted to build, and one feature that I really wanted to include was that when Quiddle reverted to his original form, he would release the water he had consumed into the level. This water would need to be able to flow, split, merge, and drain away. This of course required that I somehow simulate fluid in the game, a topic of which I knew nothing about. At first, I thought I'd try making use of the soft body physics I'd cobbled together for Quiddle's body, trying to make it spread more like a fluid, but that didn't work so well. Even if it had, I'd have no idea how to make it drain or break up easily. I then decided it was maybe time for me to actually research how one simulates fluids on computers. I read this amazing article by Shariar Sharabi and understood a solid 30-40% to 40 of it. I downloaded his project from GitHub and ran the beautiful samples. Sharabi's core concept is that water in 2D is a large grid of velocities of the fluid at each cell in the grid, along with other properties to indicate things like dye diffusion, etc. In his code, the grid represents an existing area filled with liquid and models the behavior of the liquid in this space. This wasn't quite what I wanted for my game, as I needed to add and subtract liquid. Spending a few days reflecting on what I learned from the article, I had an epiphany and realized the solution. I needed a grid as big as each level in Quiddle, whose cells represented how full of water each cell was, with zero being empty and one being full. That by itself isn't all that useful, so I added some rules. Water follows the path of least resistance, so I'll try to make it go down first. If the cell beneath it is full of water, then it will try to go left and right. The goal is to balance out the cell's water with its neighbors. You'd need a large grid to have a non-blocky fluid simulation, but large grids are slow to process with regular for loops on the CPU. Enter compute shaders, which offload processing of massive data to the GPU, and which in Unity are pretty simple to use once I wrapped my head around a few concepts. Now, the naive solution is to do something like this. Look at a cell, determine that water can move from cell A to cell B, subtract the amount of water from A and add it to cell B. The problem with this approach is that with the multiple threading of the GPU, you could have several threads wanting to update B simultaneously, ending up in a race condition. Not to mention the fact that if cell A updates B before cell C, then cell C can't act the way one would expect based on cell B's original value. So we need to add some properties to our cell, not just the amount of fluid in each cell, but also how much fluid this cell wants to transfer to its neighbors in the current frame. Then we break our logic into two shaders, or two kernels in one shader. The first figures out what amount of fluid each cell wants to transfer to its neighbors, and once that's done, a second shader goes through each cell and looks at its neighbors, adding up all the liquid they are transferring to its current value. This works great, but what happens if the sum of all the liquid transferring into a cell is greater than 1? Well, in real fluid simulations, fluid can't be compressed and you'd use projection to prevent those situations. But in my case, I need it to be just good enough. So my rule is this. If the amount of water in a cell exceeds 1 and it can't go down left or right, then it must force the water up to the cell above it. That will cause water to rise as more is added to it. I'm ready to start simulating water, but there's one thing I'm missing. Boundaries that prevent the water from flowing outside its grid. To solve this, I added a simple integer type field to my water cell. Zero for a regular cell and one for boundaries. When a cell is figuring out where to move water to, if its neighbor is a boundary, it won't move any water there. By default, I mark all cells at the edge of the grid as boundaries, so I don't have to worry about bounds checking in my compute shader. I also added another cell type called drain. If a water cell is above a drain cell, it will move all of its water down into the drain. And of course, the drain gives nothing back. Simulating a water source is as easy as setting any arbitrary water cell's fill amount to a constant value each frame. I started out with a simple 100 by 100 water cell grid and built a quick debug texture to render the results. 
Blue is for water, with the opacity of the blue indicating how full the cell is, with it switching to red if the fill amount was above 1. Purple is for boundaries, and gray is for drains. I created a small platform in the middle of my container just to see how water would flow around it. I added a button to turn on and off the water, and added a button to change a small portion of the bottom boundary to drain and back to boundary. Then I turned it off and on to see what would happen. The results were better than I expected, and super performant. I found it interesting that when the drain is toggled, the gap that appears in the center kind of resembles a whirlpool or vortex that you see when you drain a bathtub, except in 2D of course. I tried bumping up the grid to 500 by 500 but with the added resolution came weird artifacts where the water acted more like sand, piling up before spilling over. I realized it was because of my rule that the cell would only try to move water to the left or right if the cell beneath was completely full. So I took that restriction out and made it transfer water to every surrounding cell that it could if it made sense to. The result was like a misting effect, which is a little hard to see because the water kept spreading out as it fell so the cells along the path of the falling water were never that full. My solution was to add another variable to control just how full the cell below needs to be before the algorithm starts moving water to the left or right. I decreased the size of the grid by 50% and after fiddling with the variables, I had a pretty sweet simulation. This is all fine and dandy, but it's distinct from the rest of the world in Quiddle. If I want water that can pool on floors and run around obstacles, I need some way to make it aware of the level components. Since Quiddle floor collision zones are defined by polygons, I just take those points, translate them from world space to water grid coordinates, and set all the water cells between those points as boundaries, essentially tracing the floor from the level into the water grid. All that was left was whipping up a shader and shader graph to take my water grid data and apply it to an unlit sprite, using the amount full for the cell as the alpha value of the water on the texture. I also showed the boundaries in blue for debug purposes, and it's blue like the water because I'm not that good at shader graph. Finally, instead of trying to use a soft body to simulate water for the level, I could turn on the tap and fill up the level organically. This was so satisfying to watch. I did a few more experiments setting up waterfall situations, and overflowing a small area into a bigger one. Now I could set up a test level with a hydrating game element and Quiddle himself. When Quiddle is waterlogged and the user gets him to release his water, I find Quiddle's position in the water grid, and in a set radius around that point, I set all water cells to a value of 3, which makes them dump out a bunch of water at that spot for a brief while. The water still flows a little too slow for my liking, especially here when it drains from the platform on the left into the pit, but it's still very pleasurable to watch. You might have noticed that Quiddle floated on top of the water here. How did I do that if the water grid knows nothing about the rest of the world? Without getting too deep into the whole soft body physics stuff that I'll describe in a future video, Quiddle's body is a series of points that have an internal pressure system always pushing them away from the center of Quiddle's body. Gravity and collisions with other objects apply forces to those individual points, causing the jelly effect. I look at each point, get its water grid coordinate, and if there's water in that cell, I apply an upward force on that point, which makes him float. Easy peasy. You may have also noticed that Quiddle doesn't create ripples in the water. I haven't quite figured that one out yet. It might need more data added to the water cell to make it happen, but maybe that's not as important. What is important is that I have a whole new level of functionality in the game. Maybe Quiddle can flood areas to put out fires or float up objects that are needed to unlock passages. Maybe there can be ice that melts. What will I do with this newfound power? You'll have to stay tuned to find out. Links for everything are in the description. Feel free to play the Quiddle prototype I created for the Game Jam. Thanks to Game Dev TV for organizing this jam. Also check out my friend Jason's entry, Gift Train, Mother's Day Mayhem Edition, which is super fun. Support my channel. Please like, subscribe, and share, and thank you so much for watching. And as always, I'll see you in the future.